Welcome to the Sui Generous Show, your unique perspective on all things related to your constitutional rights and the criminal injustice system. With Erica Merrill, I'm attorney Brian Jones, criminal defense and civil rights warrior. Today we're talking about qualified immunity in segment one and prosecutorial discretion versus judicial discretion in segment two. To make sure you don't miss an episode of our show, make sure you dis- you subscribe to our show on the channel or podcast of your choice. Look to tlobj.com and all of our social media outlets for more information about your civil rights and the criminal injustice system. So Erica, did you see in the news this week that Representative Ayanna Presley and Representative Justin Amash introduced a bill to end qualified immunity statutorily? Yes, I did. That is just an epic uh, change in what's happening. And I I think it has a lot to do with all the protests and people standing up and having a voice. I, I think you're right, Erica. And remember, we talked about this last week, that qualified immunity is not something that our nation's founding fathers built into our constitutional system. It was a creation of the judiciary. And the only way to fix that, to remedy that wrong, is through congressional action or state legislative action. Their bill is going to try and amend 42 U.S. 1983, which is the Civil Rights Enforcement Statute, to explicitly say that qualified immunity and the doctrine invented by the Supreme Court of the United States no longer provides police officers that brutalize and violate civil rights with a defense or immunity from civil actions and the financial penalties that come with it. Yeah, it's amazing uh, what's been happening and I'm glad that you are catching everyone up today because everything is changing so fast. I mean, just last week you were saying locally uh, that they are starting to look at how uh, qualified immunity is handled in police departments and now it looks like it's it's heading right to the legislature that's right erica and local right here in columbus um, new standards were implemented this week requiring all police involved shootings to be investigated by third-party agencies so i think week over week we're going to see drastic changes in this area of law and we're making sure we stay on the cutting edge of that law and keep our listeners informed of it. Um, You know, I think it's really important for Congress to step in at this time and really clarify what they meant, their original intent, when they gave the people the sword that is 42 USC 1983, that way to get justice when state actors have violated our constitutional rights. On front of the many battles that are gonna need to be fought in order to meaningly reform police accountability, giving the people this tool to go into court when their local officials refuse to act is going to be critical to holding police accountable for their wrongful actions. I think that's it's fantastic news. It's great to see that everything that people are doing and all of the hard work and the blood, sweat and tears, and, and I mean literally, uh, is, is going to make some changes. And it's very exciting. And Erica, that's what they call a transition in this business because sweat, tears and blood is the other thing that was really big in the news this week with a variety of news outlets drawing the contrast between the police reports and the police's documentation of their enforcement of the curfews um, and their policing of the protests juxtaposed against the video recording both from private citizens and news outlets that show a completely different story. Uh, Horrifying images have been coming out for several weeks of police violence against protesters that that go back for centuries here in the United States and more accurately to the recent civil rights campaigns 
of the 60s and 70s, where we saw protesters then get blasted with fire hoses, skin torn off, dogs being unleashed on them, where today you've got protesters, they're getting sprayed in the face uh, with just a few inches of separation, with pepper spray and with tear gas, um, getting shot with rubber and wooden bullets for standing and peacefully protesting. Uh, it, it has been horrific to watch. And I mean, a lot of those things, people can get really hurt. Uh, people could die from a rubber bullet. And if it's shot in the right place, um, in close proximity. And, you know, even the one that I'm thinking of now is, is when the 73 year old man got completely pushed over to a point where he got knocked out and was in the hospital. Uh, and, and it turns out he's just got a whole history, his whole life is spent uh, peaceably protesting and uh, living a life of poverty in it so that people can have their civil rights. And uh, you know, just you hear stories like that and it is just heartbreaking. Absolutely, Erica. And that's why third party observers of these protests are so important. Um, organizations like the National Lawyers Guild of Legal Observers, media organizations like uh, the Buffalo News Station in the story that you're talking about, about the elderly individual um, who captured that upsetting video, which, you know, like we talked about, really contradicts the report uh, issued by the police. You know, the police narrative without this video would have been the story of this man violently protesting and, and almost attacking the police when the reality could be no further from the reality that they're trying to paint, where the video clearly shows he's just standing there. An officer walks up to him and gives him the old Heisman Trophy um, and knocks him to the ground. He's seen bleeding as officer after officer, rank after rank, uh, steps around and over his bleeding body. Um, and without video in these sorts of situations, the officer's version of this would be what we all accepted and learned as the truth. But what we've learned over the past several years, and we've touched several times, Erica, here in our podcast, is that the advent of the cell phone camera, the ability for the media to go out in the field with more mobile cameras and record what the police are doing has absolutely changed the narrative about policing in America. Yeah, it absolutely has. And you're right that the contrast between what really happens and what is reported, uh, it's, it's just coming out time and time again lately. And I, I mean, it, it's a really sad sign of our times, uh, but, but on the upswing, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, there's legislation that is, is, you know, going to be considered and things hopefully will change for the better because of this. And, you know, I know you have a lot of information today about, um, you know, cases where, you know, it just depends on where you live, you know, depends on, on how your case gets handled. And it depends on whether people are speaking up about injustice or not. And it'll be great when everyone gets treated the same everywhere and that it's a fair situation. Absolutely. And that goes right on to our feature topic this week, which is prosecutorial versus judicial discretion. And I'm really interested to see how these changes in how the narrative is coming out is going to affect how trial lawyers like myself present their stories in court and how prosecutors present their stories in court and how jurors judge the veracity of law enforcement officers who turn off their body cameras, who turn off their cruiser videos, um, and then try to come into court and tell a story very different from the other witnesses at a scene. So let's turn to um, our featured topic this week prosecutorial discretion versus judicial discretion. So Erica, do you know what about pro what the difference is between prosecutorial and judicial discretion are? Well, you know, I did a little research uh, before we came on here today, but I could not explain it like you can. So I'm going to leave it up to you. <laughs> uh, 
Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so prosecutorial discretion is the authority of the executive branch, police officers, prosecutors, you know, sheriff's department, other law enforcement agencies to decide whether to bring charges based on a certain set of events at all, or whether to uh, not bring charges. And specifically, if they choose to bring charges, what charges to bring under those circumstances. Judicial discretion is the power of judges to make legal decisions after a case has been filed. So under the doctrine of separation of powers, the ability of judges to exercise discretion is an, is an exercise of their judicial independence. You know, you'll recall from your high school civics class that we've got three branches of government. The legislative, which writes the laws. The executive branch, which executes, enforces, um, and acts on the laws. And the judicial branch, that guides the laws, understands the laws, explains the laws, um, and, def and, and kind of interprets the laws that are written by the, uh, the legislative branch. Now, right here in central Ohio, uh, city prosecutor Zach Klein executed his prosecutorial discretion when he decided that all of the curfew violations and citations issued to protesters would be dismissed. Now you juxtapose that, like you were talking about, it depends on where you live, with the city prosecutor Paula Muthing in Cincinnati, who has decided to move forward, prosecute, and punish protesters who were brutalized by the police in the Queen City. In this regard, what kind of justice a person who's accused receives is dependent entirely on their zip code. You have the same maltreatment of the protesters by law enforcement officers in Columbus and Cincinnati. But the protesters in Cincinnati are gonna be prosecuted and will have to spend time, money, and emotional resources proving their innocence. Whereas in Columbus, justice has now been served and Zach Klein is doing the right thing in dismissing these cases. Now, when we turn to the idea of judicial discretion, judges in Cincinnati can use their discretion to potentially dismiss these cases. One of the hot topics right now is the federal judge in the Michael Flynn case deciding whether to accept a prosecutor's decision to try and dismiss his case after a guilty plea. The judge in this case was really troubled by the prosecutor's use of their discretion and asked for it to be briefed, asked this dismissal issue to be briefed by a, a retired judge of that district. And that brief was a scathing rebuke of the Department of Justice and their misuse of prosecutorial discretion for the benefit of what seems to be kind of a crony deal where Michael Flynn, because he's part of the, the in politics group right now, is gonna get unfair benefits um, as the result of his connections. Wow, I mean, and, and this is the kind of thing where you need those checks and balances to make sure that people don't have too much power and aren't abusing it and, and to where the wrong people get hurt. That's that's exactly right. There has to be checks and balances. And you know, the, the judicial branch is supposed to act as a check on the executive and the legislative branches, and the legislative branch acts on it as a check on the other two, and the executive acts as a check on the other two. Each branch has its own duties. And what we've seen recently is the police fall into the executive branch have acquired a lot of power. And it's time for the judicial and legislative branches to step in and rein that power in and give the appropriate amount of power back to the citizens of this country. Because let's not forget, Erica, America is a nation and a government of delineated and granted powers. The Constitution first and foremost, reserves all power to the people and then grants to the government limited discretion and limited powers. 
to make sure that there's peace and order. And when one of those branches steps out of line, it's up to the other two branches to step in and say, this is inappropriate and we're gonna check you to make sure that you're put in your place and obeying the rules set up by the Constitution, both of the United States of America and the individual states. Now, prosecutors are in a position to engage in that sort of check as well, as are judges. I mean, I think that everything that you're saying just really rings true is, it's incredibly interesting. I mean, we saw it in the highest courts of the land this, this year uh, with the impeachment trials with the president. And, you know, really uh, the Senate and uh, the, the Congress taking a look at abuse of power and, you know, whether people agree with what happened or not, at least there was a check, check and balance in place. And they absolutely took full advantage of that to make sure that um, people were acting appropriately in, in our highest offices. That's exactly right, Erica. Whether you agree with the result or not, the important thing is, is that the facts were put out there and a decision was made. Now, whether you agree with the decision or not is, is a matter of personal political opinion. And in that case, if you don't like the decision, you can vote out the decision makers. The public can vote. And that may be the most powerful check on all three branches of the government. It's critically important to get out, vote your conscience, vote for what you believe in. And that check on prosecutorial and at the state level of judicial power must be exercised because otherwise we, the people, have given up our power, the power that we reserved for ourselves. Now, in state elections, you've got uh, state, county, local elections, you elect your judges. At the federal level, judges are appointed, but they're appointed by our elective legislators in the House and the, in, I'm sorry, in the Senate. So voting for those positions is critically important. You know, just look at the difference between how Columbus and Cincinnati is treating protesters for your proof of. Yeah, and it's amazing. And during this whole conversation today, I just keep thinking about that old cartoon that kids my age, <laughs> which I'm not going to reveal what that is, how we used to learn about how bills are turned into laws. And there's just this little rolled up piece of paper sitting on the steps of Capitol Hill and they're singing, I'm just a bill. <laughs> you know? And I'm just imagining like how they would rewrite that, that little, uh, educational video now with the way the power is distributed and and things are going awry <laughs> exactly and you know the interesting thing right now is that so many bills are being written in the house that are never going to get passed by the senate or signed into law by the president and likewise bills are being written in the senate that the house is never going to approve so the the division in our political system right now is really causing problems in in getting anything done you know whether you whether you want the the country to go to the right or you want the country to go to the left it makes no difference because we're not going to go anywhere because nobody can make any compromise to get anything done that's the reason the the covid 19 uh, relief packages were such a big shock to the business community and i think really quelled the the major crash in the stock market is that it was it was an amazing feat that the house and the senate the democrats and the republicans got together and got something done uh, to the benefit of everybody now again the way that it was executed a lot of people have some questions and, and some issues but it's it was a it was a real surprise and shock to see that something had gotten done well Erica, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, if, if you or anybody else out there is looking for more information about qualified immunity, prosecutorial and judicial discretion, make sure that you check us out at tlobj.com. You can find us on almost every social media platform 
at that same handle, tlobj.com, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And we'll be back next week with a new sui generis perspective on the next big thing in civil rights and criminal injustice, as well as a discussion of next week's featured topic. Now, remember when you go out there, if you come into contact with law enforcement, ask for a lawyer, no walk, no talk, no blow. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, but if you do and you get caught, call us. We'll be there to defend your rights as we would want ours defended.